morning and welcome to worship here at Bridgewater Baptist Church. This morning's service is being broadcast over our local radio station 98.7 FM, also over Facebook Live and over YouTube. If you want to learn more about the ministries going on at Bridgewater Baptist Church, we invite you to visit our website at www.bridgewaterbaptist.com. Our pastors and deacons are here for you if you need prayer or spiritual support. Uh, please reach out to us at the church office by calling 902-904-5440. And just even as you're watching this service, either over Facebook or YouTube Live, um, if you uh, need prayer, if you just need to talk to somebody, just send us a message and we're here watching with you and we would be happy to pray with you today. As a part of our service this morning, we will be talking about the residential school system and the horrific revelations of this past week. If you're a residential school or intergenerational survivor and this content is upsetting, please call the National Residential School Crisis Line at 1-866-925-4419. Our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus still calls the heavy-hearted and offers them comfort. We gather in response to his invitation. And as we worship together this morning, let us seek to, seek to find comfort in him and to find comfort in each other.
scripture reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 2 verses 22 through 28 and we read people of Israel listen God publicly endorsed Jesus of Nazareth by doing powerful miracles wonders and signs through him as you well know but God knew what would happen and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of the lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. King David said this about him, 
I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome back to part two in our uh, three-part series, Embracing the Beautiful Mystery. My name is Aaron Kenny, and I'm the lead pastor here at the Bridgewater Baptist Church. I want to begin with a quote this morning from author C.S. Lewis. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Last week we began the series by talking about the mystery of the Trinity. One God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I remember teaching a series on uh, the Trinity at the church we attended in Nairobi a number of years ago, the International Christian Fellowship uh, there in Nairobi, Kenya, talking about the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, following one of the services one uh, day, uh, this tall, distinguished African man walked up to me as we were drinking coffee in the fellowship time after the service. And he came up to me and he said, Pastor, who is this God you are talking about? I've never heard of anything like this before. I want to sit in one of your classes. And as I started talking to him, I figured he must have been someone who had just kind of wandered in and maybe had no background in the church. But I was surprised to discover that actually he had lived his whole life in the church. Not only was he a devout Christian, but he was the leader of one of the largest Christian NGOs in Africa. And so... As I was starting to talk to him, with him, I realized just how pervasive it is that some of these things we take for granted, I think, sometimes as, as pastors or as leaders in churches, that everyone must understand, they don't always get talked about in a way that really makes sense, that really connects with people. And so um, I, don't take, I don't want to take it for granted that when you hear me or someone else in church talking about Trinity or the Holy Trinity, that we're all on the same page. Now, there's a lot of mysteries that are a part of the church that uh, is important to bring out into the light and to talk about together. So that's what we're doing through this series. Just as this person, you know, lived in church all his life, but he was lacking some of the vocabulary to understand some of the things that were talked about in Scripture, so too for all of us. I think we want to deepen our understanding, our vocabulary, and understanding how we talk about God. We live in a world that oscillates between glory and grayness, between sunshine and cloud, between eternity and history, between beauty and brokenness. And so for many of us who have grown up in the Christian tradition, uh, we step into um, these stories and sometimes we'll notice things that don't fit into the story that we've kind of grown up with in our heads. And that can be a disorientating experience. Maybe you've listened to people who have used words in in relation to Christianity that you weren't used to and it just kind of had to set your head spinning. You know, are we even talking about the same God like this gentleman I was referring to a moment ago? I remember growing up at First Baptist Church Charlottetown and encountering a pastor who deeply impacted my life, um, a pastor I really admired and really um, saw as a mentor. His name was Richard Coffin or Dr. Dr. Coffin is we would refer to him. I just really loved Richard as a pastor. He, he exuded character and God's love in a way that I really admired. But if I was to be honest, when he got up behind the pulpit and started to preach, I think about half of what he said went completely over my head. And it's not that um, what he was saying didn't make sense, but I just had no frame of reference for a lot of it. When I entered seminary and I became a pastor and I started getting involved in, in, in ministry uh, and, and preaching, um, I realized that a lot of what I was saying was also not connecting with people. It was slipping over their heads. And part of that is because the truths that we're talking about, sometimes we just assume that um, you know, they are fully formed and that uh, you know, they're all kind of black and white. But the reality is that so much of what we teach and so much of what 
it makes up our faith is filled with mystery. And by the way it's baked together, there is going to be parts of it that, that no one really understands. And that we're using words to refer to something that is beyond understanding. I remember teaching a Bible study at uh, the West End Baptist Church in Halifax as an associate pastor. And during that year, I was teaching youth group and Sunday school and involved in Alpha, even the uh, senior ladies Bible study class. I was teaching it, uh, if any of you are watching your West End background, in the, just off the Bernie DeLong room, in this woman's parlor. And being in that class, talking to these people who've grown up their whole life in the church, only to discover that many of them carry that sense of shame and sense that I don't quite understand everything that I think I'm supposed to understand. That half of what the pastor says on a Sunday morning goes over my head. If you've ever felt that way, or maybe you felt you maybe you feel like that today, then I just hope that this series connects with you to give you the confidence that it's okay to believe and to hold something that you don't quite fully understand. In fact, that is probably a good indication of maturity, that we can believe something and talk about something without fully grasping all that it entails. That the truths that we talk about coming from Scripture are deep and profound truths that contain within them this mystery that we talked about last week, this tension that we can't quite resolve. And I carry that tension within me. Every time I speak, every time I'm sharing from a pulpit or, or sharing a message like this, I need to be aware that if I explain things so simply that everyone gets it, maybe I've removed the tension and what I'm teaching and what you're getting isn't really the truth. It's something less than the truth. Now through this series, we want to be embracing the beautiful mystery and recognizing that there's some things that we believe which are beyond understanding. Last Sunday, if you were with us, I hope you left the message with this deep understanding of the importance of the mystery of God, that at some level, God is unknowable. As I came to realize that I understood only half of what my pastor was teaching on a Sunday morning, it's probably because even the pastor didn't fully understand it. And that's a good thing. Even today, as I'm teaching about the Trinity and the Atonement, these are mysteries I don't fully understand. And that's the point. So if you're a Christian and you've grown up in the Christian faith, there's many mysteries that I'm sure you're used to talking about. And there's a temptation to boil them down and to remove that mystery. But when teachers do that, they're actually teaching something that's less than the truth. Now, as you're hearing me uh, talk about this this morning, I'm gu guessing that some of you are probably cringing. This idea that to make things crystal clear is to make them less than the truth. Uh, some of us just, we want everything sorted out and orderly. And we are desperate to have things organized and just laid out in a systematic way. Uh, maybe you're like that, you know, when you feel stressed, you want to clean your house. <laughs> when you feel stressed, you want to organize. When you feel stressed, you want to have everything put in their proper place. You know, some people like this would be like that character from Friends, Monica Geller. By the way, I'm hoping some of you saw the Friends reunion this last week. Wow, I didn't expect to be so grabbed by it emotionally. You know, I realized as we were watching that, that Friends reunion that that television show Friends actually paralleled with my journey from 20 when Friends began to 30, the year that Friends ended, you know, that I went on that journey with those characters during that really formative time in my young adulthood. And among those characters, there are the Gellers, and uh, Monica Geller uh, is known as putting everything in its place, that she just wants everything to be ordered and systematized, and, and if it's going to be done right, she has to do it herself. Well, for all the Monica Gellers out there, today we're going to get into uh, the question of the atonement. And your temptation might be to solve it, like it's a problem to be solved, just like the Trinity for so many people is a problem to be solved. And I want to encourage you that there's a different way to look at these beautiful mysteries. One of the core mysteries of the Christian faith is what's referred to as the atonement. Like the Trinity we talked about last Sunday, the atonement is something that followers of Jesus have had to work through as we've read scripture and studied the whole of what the Bible has to say about Jesus and try to piece together our understanding 
of what it means for what the gospel says Jesus is doing in reconciling all people back to God. The atonement really talks about at one how Jesus made us at one with God, how Jesus brought sinners in a broken world back into relationship with the Father. So that is what the atonement refers to, how Jesus brings us back into oneness or into communion or into relationship with God. And the Bible very clearly teaches that Jesus is accomplishes through his life, death, and resurrection, the atonement, the, the unity and the healing of relationship between humanity and, the, and God. The fact of the atonement unites all Christians. Uh, Christians of every denomination and creed, every Christian tradition would agree that Jesus, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has overcome sin, that Jesus has united us with God, that Jesus died for us on the cross so that we could have a relationship with God forever. We could receive the gift of eternal life. So that the question of the atonement isn't that Jesus did this. No, that, that's, that's not a question at all. The question of the atonement is, how did he do it? That's where the mystery is. That's where people want to get under the hood and poke around and try to figure out the mechanics of what Jesus was doing in his life, his death, and his resurrection. And this is where all these theories come in. Theories that often have completely divided the church. In other words, we all believe in the good news that Christ came to unite us with God the Father. And the question that divides us is how did he do it? You know, how does it work? And once we start trying to piece together how Jesus did it, we run the risk of trying to, to get rid of that tension and to dissolve that mystery and to solve the problem. And that's what I want to caution us against this morning. That any good theory or understanding of the atonement allows for that mystery as we try to, to wrestle with what was Jesus doing? How did he do it? Um, we won't, I don't think, fully understand until we are with him face to face. And so um, some people might say that agnostically, then, well, why do you even talk about the atonement if we can't understand how Jesus did it? Well, I don't want to give up and say that we don't know anything. In fact, the Bible does teach us a lot about the atonement. So there's a lot we do know. But it is held together by this tension of mystery. that We don't fully know. We don't fully understand how Jesus did what he did in bringing us into relationship with the Father. So there are some fundamental statements that Jesus makes about the significance of what he is doing when he comes and, and dies on a cross and, and brings the, the message of the gospel kingdom into the world. There are very clear things Jesus does say. And so we want to look at those today and see how um, the church has used them, sometimes wisely, sometimes unwisely, as a launching pad to reflect on the mystery of the atonement. So my own understanding of the atonement has changed throughout my life. There's ways that I, I understood and talked about it as uh, a teenager and as a young pastor. And, and now today, uh, I would have a new perspective on my understanding of the atonement. And hopefully the perspective I have today will continue to change and grow and mature throughout my life. Because you know that's what a relationship is. It is maturing and deepening and uh, hopefully we won't be the same people the day that we leave this world as the day that we came in, that we've continually all through life been growing and maturing. May that also be true in our relationship with God. So historically, Christians have created theories bouncing off the way that Jesus and the apostles talk about what Jesus did on the cross. So I want to, talk to, uh, I want to begin by talking about three ways that Jesus speaks about the atonement. And then we're going to look briefly at a few ways that the, the apostles speak about the atonement and ultimately come, I think, to a conclusion about how we deal with this great mystery. For the first way that Jesus talks about the atonement is as a ransom. Some of the earliest theories of the atonement were often referred to as ransom theories. And it's all based on this one statement Jesus makes as recorded in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1045. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is one of the first ways that we see Jesus talking about what he's going to do through the cross. Jesus never actually unpacks what he means when he says 
that he is giving his life up as a ransom for many. Uh, it seems, as you read this passage, that he's talking about ransom as purchasing a slave into freedom. That Jesus' ransom is to make us free. And so the, the, the point of the metaphor that Jesus is using here is that we, through Jesus, are freed from sin. Because of Christ, we experience freedom. And, and that's a very Jewish poetic thing to do, to, to use metaphors, to not to fully explain them, but to use them to point to deep spiritual truths, which are even beyond language. So Jesus comes to serve and to give his life as a ransom for our freedom. And for the early uh, Jewish listeners, they were fine with that. For the disciples, as they were with Jesus, they never stopped and questioned him. But later on in the early church, in those first hundreds of years after uh, the apostles, the early church fathers were very influenced, not by a Jewish way of thinking, but by a Gentile way of thinking. And in the Hellenistic world, they came to all of these questions like, who is paying the ransom? Who's the ransom being paid to? How exactly would that work? So they came up with this theory that through Jesus, God was paying a ransom to Satan. That Satan had become the kidnapper or the slave master who is holding humanity bond in bondage. And so God is going to pay a ransom, the, the life of his own son, to satisfy Satan so that he might free humanity from Satan's bondage and his trap. Now, of course, Scripture never actually tells us this. We're talking about a metaphor Jesus made about the significance of his cross, bringing about freedom as he uh, lays down his own life as a ransom for many. And so what we see in the early church is that these great thinkers trying to wrestle with how does Jesus do it, going beyond what the scriptures actually teach and creating this story to try to flesh out the missing pieces, to remove the mystery and to insert something else. They were trying to go beyond what was written. And the Apostle Paul actually warns us against this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says, Do not go beyond what is written. And so they were doing exactly the thing that Paul tells them not to do. Now the church eventually recognizes that this theory went way too far. They recognize that um, they were trying to put Satan on par with God, as if God had to negotiate with Satan. Uh, and basically that they were giving Satan way too much credit. And so the church repents of this theory. Although it's fun to think of God somehow outwitting the devil in this cosmic game of bait and switch, the church eventually moves beyond this theory and starts to look at other ways of explaining what was going on in the atonement. One of the earliest corrections to the ransom theory is the Christus Victor theory. It's another version of the ransom theory that really says that Jesus wins our freedom because he defeats the power of evil. He defeats and triumphs over Satan and death and evil that's in the world. And so the cross, Jesus' death, and his resurrection set us free from sin. And so we don't, in the, in the Christus Victor theory, really get under the hood and fully understand the mystery. But we recognize that whatever Jesus was doing, he was having victory. He was crushing the power of evil to set us free. And this theory continues to be one of the most popular theories throughout the history of Christianity. And, and there are many uh, people today, myself included, who would say, oh, this, is, this is an important way to talk about what happens in the atonement. That in Jesus' death and resurrection, he has victory over the grave, victory over evil, victory over sin and death and sets us free so that we no longer need to live in fear of death and of uh, separation from God. Um, and in the Christus Victor theory, it also points to the fact that not only does Jesus have victory over, over Satan, not only does he, he crush evil in the world and death, but then he triumphs and he is crowned king. And the irony is that there at the crucifixion, if you remember the story of Good Friday, Jesus is mocked and, and mistreated by those Roman soldiers and they put a crown of thorn on, uh, on his head and they wrap him up and give him a scepter and, and call him the king of the Jews. And they even put a sign over the cross that he is king of the Jews. 
And the irony is that in that act of his, his self-sacrifice, laying down his own life, it actually was his coronation as God will raise him from the dead and he will send to the throne of heaven at the right hand of the Father to his rightful place as King of kings and Lord of lords. So whatever Jesus is doing in the cross, at the center of the gospel, the atonement, is that Jesus has victory over sin and death and he now reigns, uh, reigns above all creation. So that's our first theories of atonement based on what Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark. But Jesus says other things also about what is going on in the Gospel. And our second passage comes from John's Gospel, chapter 3. John chapter 3, verses 12 to 18, is one of these incredibly important passages to help us to wrestle with what is going on at the center of the Gospel in the atonement. As Jesus says, I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe in him stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Here in John 3, Jesus talks about this um, story from the Old Testament about Moses lifting up uh, a serpent on a cross there in the wilderness. And uh, in that story, the, the Israelites are dying from, from these snakes that are invading their camp. And um, if they are only, all they need to do in faith is to look at this serpent that's been raised up on, on a stake and uh, they will be healed. So Jesus, who refers to himself here as the Son of Man, says that he too will be lifted up. And he will become the source of healing for the brokenness of sin that has entered the world like a poison and is killing us, leading us to death. All we need to do is to look and put our faith in him there on the cross as he is raised up. And we will be healed from the penalty of sin. So when Jesus is asked about the atonement, he shifts metaphors. First he talks about uh, a ransom giving us freedom. And then he talks about healing, that he will sacrifice himself so that we might be healed. Now, a danger with all of these atonement theories is to pick our favorites and say, this alone, this one metaphor explains it all. And if I focus on this, I don't need to look at the other atonement uh, passages. And of course, that's just us putting our own preference or our own opinion above what all of scripture teaches. And the danger is that we can come to the New Testament and pick one of these theories and say, if you don't believe that all the truth is found here, then you're wrong. And we can start to judge other people. And we miss the, the beauty and the breadth of the mystery that's going on in the teaching of Scripture. That what Jesus is doing on the cross is both what he says in Mark, it's both what he, and what he says in John, but it's also more than that. We keep going through the New Testament. We see in this third passage that's in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, Jesus talking about what's going on in a completely different metaphor. It's here uh, that night, when he's, the night he's betrayed, before he goes to the cross. He's with his disciples on that Last Supper. And there at the Last Supper, he takes a cup. And Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So here in Luke's Gospel, we see a third way that Jesus talks about the atonement. Here he's talking about it being a new covenant, a new relationship, a new contract between God and humanity. And this contract, just like those contracts in the Old Testament where an animal was, was broken and the blood spilt uh, as a sign that this covenant is, is official, Jesus is now saying his own blood, his own sacrifice will be spilt to establish this new covenant, this new relationship between God and humanity. And so there at the Last Supper, when Jesus is surrounded by his disciples, he picks up this cup 
and gives them this new image and says that every time that uh, they are t together around a meal like this, they are to remember his death until he returns. That what he is doing in creating this new covenant is for the forgiveness of our sins. So that our, our relationship, our communion with God would be restored and that we would once again be God's people as God intended from the very beginning of the story of the world. This is a whole new way of being in relationship with God. It's unlike any that came before it and it is established in Jesus himself, God the Son, who came to be among us, who suffered and died so that we might be restored in our relationship with the Father. Based on the reflections of the apostles, uh, we see other ways of looking at the atonement. So we have these, these three ways that Jesus talks about what's going on at the center of the gospel. But Jesus' own disciples and the Apostle Paul will continue to reflect on what was going on at the center of the gospel. Uh, one uh, beautiful way that it's expressed is by the Apostle Paul when he says that God was demonstrating his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It was around the 1100s that a theologian named Abelard really grabbed a hold of that idea that God in Jesus was demonstrating to us his love. And he came up with a theory that's still today uh, held called the moral influence theory. That in the incarnation, the story of Christmas and Jesus' life and his death on the cross and his resurrection, all of it, the whole story, God was demonstrating his love for us and showing us through the example of Jesus what does it mean to live in relationship with God, to fully live out a life that God intended us to live as his people. And so this becomes the moral influence theory that what Jesus is doing in the gospel, the whole of the gospel, the, including the cross, including the resurrection, the full story, is there to influence us, to change us so that our lives would become aligned with the life that God calls us to and that we would experience salvation in Jesus, but also that we would live out that salvation in uh, the way that we follow him as um, little Christs or Christians. Another great theory that came out uh, around that same time was by Anselm of Canterbury. Anselm looked back on that earlier theory we talked about, the ransom theory, where trying to solve the atonement by saying that God paid a ransom to the devil. Anselm rightly recognized that there was something wrong with that theory, but he went beyond it and, and came up with a different idea of debt. And he looked at the legal language that we sometimes see being used by the Apostle Paul and had this idea that you know, there was something going on like in a divine cosmic courtroom. And on the cross, Jesus not only died for us, he wasn't only our substitute, but there on the cross, he receives the penalty of our sin that God pours out his wrath, pours out his judgment and his anger upon Jesus the Son. This idea has become known as penial substitutionary atonement. PSA, or penial substitutionary atonement, is this idea that what's going on underneath the hood of the atonement? Well, God is taking out his anger and his wrath that we deserve, and he's giving it to Jesus. Now, this goes beyond what the scriptures actually teach. Nowhere in scripture will you find a verse that says that God poured his wrath out on Jesus, God the Son. It's not there. But many of us assume it's there because this is such a popular theory. And it's often espoused and talked about from behind pulpits, especially in evangelical churches. But again, it's one of those theories that is trying to remove the mystery and kind of squeeze down the atonement into something that we all think we can understand. But when we do that, that theory becomes something less than the truth. So Jesus bore our sin, but does God need to punish him, to vent his wrath? Does God somehow need to, to get angry and make someone hurt in order to forgive? That's the problem, I think, that's behind penal substitutionary atonement. That forgiveness and grace are based on violence. Now, we don't see this in Scripture, and we certainly don't see it in the teaching of Jesus. When Jesus meets people who are being uh, found guilty of sin, Jesus freely forgives them. In the story of the woman caught in adultery, for example, it's the religious people who want to stone her. They want to take violence out on her to make her pay for her sin. And Jesus tells them that he who is 
not is without sin can cast the first stone. And as these people start to realize what Jesus is saying, he tells the woman to go and to sin no more. Jesus never says that she must suffer because of what she's done. He offers her forgiveness. And throughout the parables, we see again and again, the, the justice of God is not retributive. It's not that God only gets justice by making the bad people suffer. It's restorative and it's distributive. The, the justice of God redeems and restores. And, and, and God's justice makes sure that those who are weak and vulnerable and on the edge and on the margins of society, that they are cared for just as much as those who are at the center, those who are at the top of the pyramid, so to speak. No, God's justice says that all people belong, that all people have dignity, that all people reflect his image and his beauty in the world. There's this uh, uh, Mennonite pastor in Ontario named Bruxy Cavey that I think some of our church, uh, some people in our church have, have encountered uh, as he was a guest speaker two summers ago uh, at our meetings here in uh, Moncton. And, and Bruxy likes to say that if my son took a Sharpie and I caught him you know, writing all over the furniture in the living room, as his dad, I could say, son, what you did was wrong and I forgive you. But he said, it would be pretty weird if I said to my son, son, give me back that Sharpie. I'm going to forgive you. But first, go get the cat because I've got to take out my, I've got to vent my anger. I've got to take out my rage. He said, that would be abusive. <laughs> that, that, is a, that is not real forgiveness. Forgiveness that is dependent on making someone suffer. That version of forgiveness is not the kind of forgiveness that we see Jesus teaching about. That's not the kind of forgiveness that we see at the center of the gospel. In fact, as we read the gospels through the lens of our understanding of the Trinity, one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we see that on the cross, Jesus wasn't by himself and God was above pouring out his wrath on Jesus. No, we see through the teaching of the Trinity that there on the cross, Jesus was there present with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit that the act of Jesus' death, the work of atonement, was done by the whole of God, the complete trinity. In fact, Paul will say this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 21. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is a mystery, and when we try to boil it down, and we would take that mystery out, we'll probably end up with something far less beautiful and far less true than what we actually see in Scripture. When we look at how the apostles talk about Jesus, when we look how the apostles talk about the Gospels, we see a God who loves us and is calling us back into relationship with him. Throughout the book of Acts, there are 14 sermons. This is how the apostles and you know, those disciples, as they go into the world and are proclaiming the truth of the Gospel, this shows us how they talked about what Jesus was doing. And not once in those 14 sermons do they talk about hell. Not once do they talk about God's wrath being poured out on Jesus. In fact, Erica today read from the very first sermon in that series. It was in Acts chapter 2. And if you look at that sermon just one more time now, Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 24, we read, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep a hold on him. As we read that passage in the book of Acts, we see a couple things right off the bat. The cross and the work of atonement was God's plan. It was all of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, 
worked together. This was their plan from the beginning. And Jesus wasn't someone who just was made against his will to be a sacrifice. No, Jesus is God the Son, worked with God the Father and God the Spirit to draw us back into relationship with him. And the violence that happens on the cross is not God pouring out violence on Jesus. No, we read here Peter saying that the violence was from wicked men. It was our violence, our human wrath, our politics and religion mixing all the way through the Gospels. We see again and again that the leaders, those people who were given authority in those communities, wanted Jesus dead because he threatened their power and their privilege. And it was human evil that crucified Jesus. Now Jesus says, no one can take my life away from me. I will lay it down and I will pick it back up again. But the actual violence in this story doesn't come from God. It comes from people like us. And there on the cross, Jesus takes all the wrath, all of the evil that humanity could ever pour on him. He takes it upon himself and is a suffering servant. He suffers with those who are abused, those who are weak in society. And Jesus dies in that moment, and he is raised from the dead. Jesus fulfills the law, and he takes our place, and he brings us back into unity with God. Jesus is our substitute. The issue I have with this theory is the whole idea of penal, that God would somehow be the one to torture his son, because that is not the gospel. Jesus takes the penalty of death. Jesus took our death. That's good. But it's far from saying that God poured his wrath out upon Jesus. For Jesus, justice is not retributive. It's not about vengeance. Justice is distributive. It's about caring for the weak and the vulnerable. God protecting, God being compassionate, God being loving. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us to draw us back, to reconcile us, to connect us once again with God. Why does this matter? Well, I think it matters because if we get this wrong, if we start to try to remove the mystery from the great truths of our faith, we will have a warped view of God. We will have a warped view of the gospel and it will warp us. If violence can be redemptive, if we start to think of violence as being the respectable way to love people, then we're in a whole lot of trouble. This week in Canada, we were reminded about where these ideas lead. That this kind of wickedness and evil can actually warp the way that we interact with the world and other people. That if, if you can't tolerate the mystery of God, then how are you going to tolerate people who are different than you? And we see this all through history, from the, from the Crusades to the Spanish Inquisition, from the Holocaust to the residential schools. We don't need to look very far to find horror that can be committed by people who claim to be following Jesus, but have actually re replaced him with something far, far less. If Jesus were to come today, where would we find him? But we would find him with the marginalized and the oppressed and the people who are abused and suffering at the edges of society. For Jesus came to heal and not to hurt. He came to set free not to enslave. Jesus came to forgive and not to condemn.
It's our tradition here at Bridgewater Baptist Church and throughout Atlantic Canada um, to celebrate Holy Communion on the first Sunday of each month. Here we practice open communion, which means that anyone who has received Jesus Christ as Savior and endeavor to follow him as their Lord are welcome to come and participate and to receive the elements of the bread and the cup. Wherever you are today, if you would like to be with those you're with, or even if you're on your own, to take uh, a cup and to take bread you too can participate in this uh, symbolic act, this communion. Jesus tells us that um, what he is doing in the gospel is for our own good. He describes it in many ways, including a cup of suffering, a cup poured out in his own blood so that we might be reconciled to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. We read in uh, the letter to the Corinthians, for I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Today as we come to receive the gift of the bread and the cup, we need to examine ourselves. And as we've been talking this morning about the ways that we can remove the mystery of our faith and try to make God something less than what God is, there are ways that we can allow that same evil to creep into our lives and into our relationships. Evil that can create prejudice, evil that can divide us and create hatred, evil that can even make us despise the very people we're supposed to love. Today, as we come to this time of communion, may we examine ourselves, and may this be an opportunity for us to seek forgiveness, forgiveness from the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit, but also forgiveness we might seek for those whom we have harmed, and that we might be a part of bringing about healing and restoration in the world. For as we have been reminded today, God calls us to be ambassadors, to participate in his great work of reconciliation of all people in all the world. Jesus said to his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we eat this bread and drink from this cup, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you love us and that your love was not conditional but an unconditional love extended to us, Lord, by the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. God, we, want, we desire to receive your love today. We desire to live in the reality of the grace of Jesus Christ and by the empowering of your Holy Spirit to be connected to you and to one another as we might be a part of your kingdom work in this world. 
Lord, wherever there is brokenness and wherever there is darkness and wherever there is hurt, wherever there is death, may we bring the light and the healing and the hope of Jesus Christ in and through our lives to be there to be able to lift one another up and to be a part of your great work in this world. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us for the ways that, Lord, we have settled for less. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness, for your restoration, that the righteousness of Jesus would come upon us, and that we would live the lives that you call us to live by his power and his strength. For we pray this together in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Let us eat now in thanksgiving. And let us drink in anticipation of Christ's return. Amen. Once again for joining us for worship today. May we go forth in this new week in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.